If you have been following our channel for a while, you are probably aware that we love discovering games that have a connection to real life events, or even contain a reference to the real world, no matter how unclear that reference is. This channel is actually the first one on the internet to reveal the true story behind Lucy and Visage, Nine Childs Street, and The Bridge Curse 2. If you check the internet websites, you'll find most of them focus on the popular games, where the real-life inspiration is clear, but there are dozens of hidden small games that they ignore, and most people never get the chance to even know their existence. It's disappointing that many content creators seem to avoid digging deeper into the real-life inspirations behind certain horror games, and instead they prefer surface-level titles. It feels like a missed opportunity to explore the fascinating connections between fiction and reality in the horror genre. The good news, however, is that for curious people like me, there's always something to be found if you delve deep enough into the ocean of indie horror games and focus on the details to not miss even the most unknown ones. After we explain the real-life inspiration of several relatively popular horror games in the past, today I wanted to delve into the story of a very small and mysterious title that I am sure none of you have heard of or played before. The game in question is called Hinter, and it came out two years ago back in 2022. Nobody really heard of this game, and the reviews are kind of mixed, because it needs some improvement when it comes to optimization and overall quality. But our focus today is not on the gameplay or the technical side, but rather on the dark story that this game tells. Hinter is a 19 style retro horror experience, and it's intentionally designed to look this way to give you a feeling that you're in the past because of the timeline of the story. In the game, you play as a German man named Andreas Graber, the head of the Graber family in Bavaria, and this family sadly went through a terrifying incident. The story begins shortly before the tragic events, allowing you to explore a place called the Hinter Kaifik Farm and speak with other family members to find some answers to this horrific mystery. This seems like an interesting chilling plot for a horror game, but what's even more interesting is that the family, the farm, and the events are far from being fictional. In order for us to discover the real events behind this story, we need to go back 122 years in Germany, to reach the year 1922. The specific place we're talking about is in a small city called Weidhoven, inside the state of Bavaria. In this location, there was a large farm called Hinterkaifeck, which belongs to a prominent family called the Grabbers. And by the way, please don't focus a lot on my pronunciation of the German names in this video. Most people say it's Hinterkaifeck and Grubers, but I'll go with Hinterkaifeck and Grubers, because the real pronunciation in German is definitely different than both. Anyway, the farm was built in 1863, and it was really well built and taken care of. The Grubber family lived a quiet and isolated life at this farmstead, they were known for keeping to themselves and had a reputation for being somewhat reclusive and outlandish. In other words, they were the type of people who don't want anyone to stick their nose in their business or even get too close to them, which explains why they built their home away from other busy places. The family is also relatively big and it has six members. The head of the family is Andreas Graber, a 63-year-old man who is known as a stern and controlling figure. In fact, many rumors also mention a suspicious relationship between him and his daughter, but I will explain this part later. The second main member is Kazilia Graber, the 72-year-old wife of Andreas, 
She was an old woman who rarely left the farm. She was known for being a traditional lady and devout in her beliefs. In the same home, there was also Victoria Gabrielle, their 35-year-old daughter, who was a widow with two children. Aside from the death of her husband, she had a crazy life, and many rumors reveal suspicious events about her. Her two children are seven-year-old Kazilia, who is named after her grandmother, and two-year-old Joseph, who was born outside of marriage, and there are many hidden mysteries behind his birth. The daughter Kazilia was known for being a lovely and cheerful child. She attended school in the nearby village and was very loved by her classmates and teachers. She was smart, respectful, and had very good manners. She was basically the biggest source of light in the house. Along with the family members, there was also a woman called Maria Baumgartner, who started living with them on March 31, 1922. She is a 44-year-old maid who came to replace the previous worker, who left due to a feeling of distress and bizarre events. Generally, the family was relatively self-sufficient, relying on their farm for income and means of support. They had little interaction with the outside world, and they didn't want anyone to visit them or even try to be friends with them. Their lives were shrouded in mystery and speculation, with rumors of infidelity, bizarre intimate relationships between the members, and hidden conflicts adding to their enigmatic reputation. Their isolation may have actually contributed to the dark secrets inside their place, and this probably led to the tragedy that happened afterwards. If you're not familiar with the story, you're probably wondering what tragedy I'm talking about. Before I reveal the exact incident, we need to talk a little bit about what happened in the days prior. In the weeks of March 1922, the Grabber family experienced unsettling events, including unexplained footsteps in the attic, missing house keys, and a mysterious newspaper appearing on the property from nowhere. Many of you might say, what can be mysterious about a newspaper? Well, a normal newspaper that you bought might not be worth mentioning. But the problem is that Andreas found a newspaper that he never bought, and he was never subscribed to receive it in the first place, which means that the postman did not bring it to the house. Andreas also told the neighbors that he discovered footsteps on the snow that came from the forest and led to a broken door lock in the farm's machine room. On top of all of this, the maid who was working in the house during these days decided suddenly to quit, claiming the house was haunted and there is something paranormal about it. Lucky for her, her decision to quit will literally turn out to be the best decision of her entire life, because it helped her avoid a deadly fate. After a short time since her departure, the family received her replacement, Maria, on March 31st. But unfortunately for Maria, her decision to come work here will be her worst and last decision in her life. On April 1st, the coffee seller, Edward Shirovsky, arrived at the farm to take an order, but received no response despite knocking over and over. He saw an open gate, but ultimately left and didn't want to investigate further. A few days later, the teachers started noticing how Kazilia was absent from school without any explanation. The family's absence as a whole was felt by neighbors who used to see them in stores and gatherings. On April 4th, local mechanic Albert Hofner visited the farm to fix an engine. However, he didn't meet any family members and only heard the sounds of animals and the dog within the barn. 
After waiting for an hour, he started doing his repair job, which took him four hours to complete. But despite this long wait, no one showed up to speak with him. On the same day, a neighbor by the name of Lawrence Schlittenbauer sent his son and stepson to the farm to see if they could find the family. They went, but they later came back and said they didn't see anyone. Lawrence then decided to go back by himself with two other men. But once they arrived and explored the house, they saw a shocking scene. They found Andreas, Kazelia, Victoria, and young Kazelia inside, brutally murdered. After further investigation, the bodies of the little boy, Joseph, and the maid, Maria, were also found inside the house. In other words, every person in the house was found dead. Lawrence and the other neighbors were shocked, and they called the authorities immediately. This is when Inspector George Ringweber and his department began investigating the killings to understand what really happened. But the problem is that this mission will turn out to be one of the most complex in history. The first bizarre thing that they noticed is that people seem to have interacted with the crime scene by moving the bodies, using items, and even cooking food in the kitchen. The scene made investigators believe that the perpetrators had remained on the property for days after the murders, taking care of the animals and also eating meals in the house. And by the way, I say perpetrators because the initial evidence made it look like there was more than one person in the place, but it can also be one killer. These details shocked the community and sparked an even bigger investigation to find any clues that might lead to who's behind this. But the issue is, every clue leads to a different conclusion. This is when physicians intervened to perform autopsies on everybody in the barn. The autopsies revealed that they were all killed with blows to the head from a pickaxe, which is a tool that's common on farms. However, the strange part is that the 35-year-old daughter Victoria suffered the most blows, with at least seven to her face and skull. The experts also stated that the murders likely occurred in the evening of March 31st. This is why I said the maid Maria made the worst decision of her life when she came to work here. She literally arrived in the house a few hours before the tragedy, which means that if she had come a day later, she would have probably avoided this brutal death. The physician also mentioned that the little girl, Kazelia, has been alive for hours after the attack, and she has been struggling until her death. The problem, however, is that the investigators didn't find the weapon anywhere. To understand more details, the medical experts decided to take the skulls of the victims and send them to the German capital for further examination. At this point, the first theory that came to mind was robbery, which pushed the police to question travelers, vagrants, and neighbors. But this theory was abandoned when a significant sum of money was discovered within the house. This means that the killer was not interested in stealing anything, and the fact that they stayed for days in the house indicates that robbery was never the goal. After failing to think of a clear motive, investigators began forming a list of suspects to try to limit the possibilities as much as they could. And this is when things get much more interesting and dark. The first suspect they thought was Carl Gabriel, the husband of daughter Victoria Gabriel. But the problem is, Carl has been dead for years at this point. So why the heck would the police suspect a dead man to be the killer. Well, it's a little bit complicated. He was officially declared dead in 1914, during the World War I, but the suspicious part is that his body was never recovered. 
After the murders, people started to believe he may have faked his death, came back to the farm, and murdered the family out of revenge or anger. But this begs the question, why would he seek revenge in the first place? The answer to this question lies in the secrets of his wife, Victoria, and also in the disturbing life of the family as a whole. As I said earlier, Victoria had her second child, Joseph, in mysterious circumstances, where his father is not known. Everyone in the neighborhood said that the child was probably the result of a forbidden relationship between Victoria and her own father, Andreas. And this was actually documented by the court. Even though the court accused both the father and the daughter, it is stated that Andreas was forcing her to engage in this with him. Which means that she's a victim, even though Carl probably did not know that part. The first theory against Carl is that he killed the entire family because of his anger towards his wife, Victoria, because he thought she cheated on him with another man, which might explain why she received the most blows with a pickaxe. What made investigators suspect Carl even more was the fact that he lived in the house before, and he would have been familiar with the layout of the farm its routines, and the location of tools like the pickaxe used in the murders. Even though these ideas are logical, the problem, however, is that Carl at that time remains dead in official records. So, if he's alive, where the heck is he? For the next 24 years, no one found any hint about him until 1946 after the Second World War ended. In that year, German war prisoners were released from Soviet prisons, and they said that they had been sent by a German-speaking Soviet officer, who literally told them that he's the one who committed the murders. I want you to think about this for a second. We're talking here about a German man who was a Soviet officer. Many of you might think how would the German guy be a Soviet officer? Well, rumors in the area stated that Karl, the husband in question, actually expressed a desire to go to Russia before his disappearance and supposed death. Please keep in mind that the timeline we're talking about in this part was way before the Second World War, and even before the first one. This means that the idea of a German man going to Russia and eventually reaching a position in the army there is not really far-fetched. I mean, who knows, maybe Karl had communist beliefs and was interested in joining the communist movement in Russia that intensified in the 1910s. Despite these powerful arguments, nothing was confirmed and the claims of the released soldiers were not considered credible because of their contradictions. In other words, he was never officially found after his supposed death. And this leads us to the second suspect on the list, who is none other than Lorenz Schlittenbauer, the neighbor I mentioned earlier. Even though Lorenz was among the first people to report the murders, the police couldn't ignore his possible involvement. The reason for this is that there are motives and elements that can actually push him to have a problems with the Grabber family. After the death of his wife in 1918, it is believed that Lawrence had a secret relationship with Victoria, and he might be the real father of her son, Joseph. The rumors also say that Victoria used to receive child support payments from Lawrence, but he allegedly stopped paying at some point and refused to help her with the child. Victoria was reportedly planning to take legal action against him for financial support, which means that the murders could have been a way for him to eliminate the financial burden and any potential claims against his property. However, the biggest reason that made police suspect him was his knowledge of the farm and its surroundings. As a neighbor, 
Lawrence was familiar with the specifics of the farm and everything about the daily lives of the people there, including the location of tools like the pickaxe used in the murders. This is the same suspicion they had with Carl, but the difference with Lawrence is that investigators could not help but notice his bizarre behavior when discovering the bodies. He was one of the first people to arrive at the farm after the bodies were discovered, and he allegedly tampered with the crime scene, potentially to cover up his involvement. For example, when he and his friends arrived at the farm, they had to break the gate to access the barn due to all doors being locked. However, after discovering the four bodies inside, Lawrence slowly entered the house alone, using a key, raising questions about his intentions. I mean, think about it for a second. He pretended that he had no access to the property when he was with the other guys, but when he was alone, he actually had a key to open the doors. What's even more weird is that a key to the house was reported to be missing a few days before the murders. At first, this might be enough evidence to arrest Lawrence. But the problem is, there's also a chance that he got the key from the family, as a neighbor who should intervene in emergencies, or maybe from Victoria, considering that he was her lover. When the two guys with him asked him about why he entered the house alone, he responded by saying he wanted to check on his little son, Joseph. This answer might be an attempt by him to explain why he interacted with the bodies and messed with the crime scene before the arrival of police. Years passed after the murders and Lawrence remained the main suspect in the area, for many reasons even though nothing was confirmed against him. In 1925, a local teacher by the name of Hans E. Blogger saw Lawrence visiting the grabber's farm after it got demolished. When the teacher got curious and asked him about the murders, Lawrence responded by saying the killer could not bury the bodies in the barn due to the frozen ground. This made it seem like Lawrence had detailed knowledge of the conditions at the time of the murders. Although, as a neighbor, he might have been just making a guess according to his expertise in farms. Long story short, Lawrence was never arrested, and he even won many civil claims for slander in court against people who called him a murderer. He eventually died in 1941, 19 years after the crime and he was never officially found guilty. But if you think the investigations stopped, then you're wrong. The other suspects in the crime are two siblings, known as the Gump brothers. One of these brothers is Adolf Gump, and he was basically a suspect from the first week of the investigations due to his connections to a group called Freikorps Oberland. I don't know if I'm pronouncing these German names correctly, but please bear with me. This entity was basically an armed organization that fought against both the communist and Polish uprisings. In fact, it is said that Gump was involved in the murder of nine farmers in a region in Poland during a fight against Polish rebels in 1921. After several decades, in 1951, the prosecutor Andreas Pop investigated the two brothers, Adolf and Anton Gump, as potential suspects in the Grabber murders. This was the result of a confession from their sister, who claimed they were the killers shortly before her death. Anton was briefly detained, but the case against him was eventually dropped in 1954, due to a lack of evidence linking him to the crime. Meanwhile, his brother had already died in 1944. This is when we can actually say that this case is one of the most insane in history. Despite decades of investigations and claims, the identity of the killer remained a mystery. More than 100 suspects were identified over the years, but the evidence keeps sending the police in other directions all the time. I can't talk about each one of them because that will take hours, but I will give you a quick breakdown of some more significant 
ones. Among them are two brothers, called Carl and Andreas. Even though they were never officially accused, in 1971, more than 50 years after the crime, a woman by the name of Therese wrote a letter explaining an event that happened when she was 12 years old. She said that she saw her mother speaking with the mother of Carl and Andreas, and the woman claimed her sons were responsible for the murders, and she even mentioned that Andreas regretted losing his pen knife during the crime. This detail was significant because a pen knife had actually been found at the demolished farm in 1923, although it couldn't be definitely linked to anyone. However, the investigation into this hint yielded no results, and the former maid at the farm claimed she had seen the pen knife on the property before the murders. And speaking of the maid, she also led police to suspect another two brothers, known as the Taller Brothers, who had a history of robbery in the area. She said that she remembers Joseph Taller coming to her window at night, inquiring about the family and claiming that he knows about their sleeping times and financial status. She also said that he explained how he knows everything about the forbidden relationship between Victoria and her father. The maid also noted the presence of another person during this conversation. She said both Joseph and the stranger were looking at the machine house and then upwards. However, as usual, this was never confirmed and the investigation always reached a dead end. The case was basically closed in 1955, despite countless arrests. The last official attempt happened in 1986, when the last interrogations took place. After that, the files were abandoned and most of the investigators retired without finding the killer. This is when the mystery went beyond the borders of Germany and landed in the United States, because theories started coming even from American figures who started piecing together some clues. One of these figures is the writer Bill James, who wrote a book called The Man from the Train, where he says that Paul Muller, a German immigrant, may have been the killer. This man, Paul, was a prime suspect in an 1898 family murder in the US and is believed by Bill James to have killed dozens of families. On top of that, the German case shares similarities with Paul's alleged crimes in the United States, including the slaughter of an entire family in their isolated home using the pickaxe as a weapon. And he also manipulated the victims' bodies and doing all of this for unclear reasons, beyond robbery. The writer Bill James speculates that Paul, who is described as a German immigrant in the media, might have returned to Germany by 1912, when scrutiny increased around similar murders across the United States. In other words, Bill is saying that Paul is a German serial killer who came to the US and committed his first mass murder with a pickaxe against a family who was living on a farm in 1898. Then he escaped back to Germany and probably committed an identical crime against the Grabber family. This sounds like a very compelling possibility, even though we can never verify it, because Paul died a long time ago and he was never found anyway. He was not even caught for what he did in the United States, let alone in Germany. Despite all these suspects I mentioned and many more, the killer of the grabbers was never identified. And the case remains a global mystery to this day. In my opinion, whoever did it must have had a relationship with the family in one way or another. The fact that the killer lived in the house for days after the murders and did casual tasks like taking care of the animals and making meals in the kitchen makes me believe that they're very familiar with the farm. 
The second element that I can't overlook is that the crime seems very, very personal to me. The brutality of the killings feels like it's coming from a person who's actually angry and full of hatred towards them. And that's why even the little children did not get any mercy. I don't know about you, but all these hints force me to think about the husband, Carl. I mean, what if he really was alive, and his death was a fabrication by him to seek revenge against the family? I forgot to tell you earlier that Carl's marriage to Victoria was not really about love and care. In fact, many reports say that Victoria married him to hide her first pregnancy with her daughter, which probably was the result of an incident with her father or some other man. We will never know the exact father of both kids, but we almost know for sure that Carl is not among the possibilities. His role in the marriage was basically a cover to hide the family's disturbing intimate activities and Victoria's reputation. However, keep in mind that all rumors regarding these incidents within the family say that the father, Andreas, was the main reason behind them. It is highly suggested that he was taken advantage of his daughter Victoria, and he didn't even let her have a happy life with Carl after the marriage, especially because he was living with them too. Anyway, in order for this theory about Carl to make any sense, he needs to be alive in 1922 first, which really makes the whole story even more wild. This is all I have for this mystery, because I swear diving into every detail about this family would make my brain explode. Everything is complicated and their lives were a mess by default. There are so many crazy intimate relationships and rumors from all sides without anything being proven. So please like this video if you loved it and make sure to give me your own theories in the comments below. See you in the next one.